Good morning, ladies, and welcome to this week's Parsha of Mishpatim, which we're going to push to the side a bit because I always have a mission that we should, when we do the Begill of Esther on Purim, we should really get a deep understanding of what we're seeing. And every year that I prepare this, I see more and more how it's so applicable. This is the last Yantif and Gullus is Purim, and it's instructive to us how to live through Gullus. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll be talking about it, you know, today. And I wanted to give myself a good three weeks. That's what a good thing about Zoom <laughs> is that I hope to put a little bit about the Parsh each week as well. But this way, I want to be able to finish the whole Megillah um, by Purim. So we'll all be very, very prepared. I have a twofold mission. One is to show how every word of the Megillah is significant. It's not mincing a word. And two, I'm going to use somebody that was fairly contemporary, primarily today. I'm almost exclusive using his parish. And then uh, later I'll be including others and in other subsequent weeks I'll be using other parishim. But I'm using the thoughts of Rabbi Brevda Zechren Lavracha, who was a phenomenal Baal Musa, one of the last Bali Musa in our generation. And he opens up Megillah Sester like you've never seen before. It's not the Megillah you all learned as children, and we don't want to learn it as children. If Yaakov Kamenetsky, Zechren Lavracha, used to say that if you wear, if a man wears tzitzis of a three year old, He's not fulfilling the mitzvah of tzitzis. It's, it's too short on him. It doesn't do its, its job. We too cannot suffice to just know the Megillah the way we knew it as children. It's definitely a whole different Megillah and it's a Megillah, believe me. When we see all the intricacies and, and how everything in, is interwoven, it's phenomenal. But first let's have a word about the Parsha. Just to say something on the Parsha. When B'nai Israel were by Har Sinai, they saw a vision it says, the Pasuk tells us, Perak Chaf Dalet Pasuk Yud tells us, Besachas Raglov Kemase Nivlas Hasapir. That uh, they saw Hashem, whatever that means. I'm not the, a Kabbalist or someone worthy of saying what that means. But under Hashem's throne, so to speak, it's like he has a brick of sapphire. Okay? Why is there a brick of sapphire? So Rashi says, He haisalafanav b'shas hashibud Yisrael. They were during the whole enslavement of the Jews in Egypt. Hashem had, so to speak, this brick under his throne to remember the suffering of the Jewish people. To remember that the Jews were subjugated to working with bricks. They had to do so much brick work that Hashem had, had a constant reminder of all the Jews suffering in Egypt. Now, this is already, the Jews are out of Egypt. It's over. So we have two questions on this. Number one, why are we having this memorial when the whole thing ended? And number two, what, what is the point here? What's the point that he had, you know, and, you know, Sapphire is not exactly suffering, but, uh, you know, it's still, that, what does it mean he had to have that before him? Hashem, what, Hashem forgets? So we're, it says Rav Nassim Vachvogel, Zechron Levracha, who was the famous Meshkiach in Lakewood, uh, with Rav Aaron Cutler, Rav Nassim Bachla, holy man, holy, holy, holy man, thought about Mashiach coming every second. Um, Rav Nassim says that there's two ideas here. Idea number one is that it's, it's, a, a re, it's a prompt for us. We see it also in Shmos. We didn't take up that topic this year, but the topic is that we have to have a constant reminder of how other people are suffering. And especially now, believe it or not, sometimes when we're suffering, we get so involved in our own suffering, we can't think about other people. Hashem, so to speak, needed some kind of, you know, prompt in front of him, uh, you know, it, it, to remind him to think deeply about other people. The story about Rav Nachum Zev, the son of Rav Simcha Zizel, the Alter Fin Kelm, um, who uh, one time that... Uh, that, that he, he had a student that was sick with Yen or Machla, you know, with the, the, the big C, as you call it. And um, he could not contain himself. He was so broken. He says, I can't hold it anymore. There was a story about once his son broke his leg and he felt he had to go into a room to ponder how it must feel so he could totally feel with his fellow. 
You know, we have to do that sometimes. We have to, it's a good idea as an exercise, maybe for this week, one of the exercises, maybe McGillis Esther will give us a second exercise, but exercise number one is let's spend a little bit of time, maybe once a day, thinking about somebody else and their suffering. And there's people, so many people, and even the people that seem the most difficult, they're probably suffering the most. Those difficult people, sometimes we should think more about them. We have to excuse them for their deep suffering, how much they're going through. You know, there was a story I read a long time ago when, um, I think it was in the Ted that when, Rav, when Rav, what's his name? Rav, um, ah, Rav Shalom Rabashkin, she should be Gesundheit Stark, got out of jail. There was a person the morning he was liberated, that person showed up in a certain uh, uh, small store in Muncie and he bought himself a cinnamon Danish. And the proprietor said, what do you, you buy before Shachar's like, why are you buying this now? I never saw you here at this time. Anything special, okay? And he said, I'll tell you the truth. It's my favorite Danish, the cinnamon Danish. I didn't eat a Danish the entire time that Shalom Rubashkin was in jail. And this is not a friend, not a, not a relative. This was Stamayid, that he could not, he felt he had to somehow minimize things he was going through to feel for his fellow. You know, this is how the Jew, you know, this is how Moshe Rabbeinu became so great. Vayar Basivlo Sam, he saw the suffering of the other people. It's something we have to like think about, you know, every once in a while, like how, how can we think about others? And, and you know what? It takes a lot off. It, you, some people think it makes them more miserable, but Saras Rabim Chatsi Nechama, that if a person, th when you, when there's pain in the multitudes, it's a comfort. I'm not alone. I'm not the only one suffering. I think uh, such a global suffering going on now in so many places, you know, that that's what we have to work on is to try to think. And more than that, if we can ease their suffering, you know, a good word to call people, call people that are all alone to, you know, to think of, reach out a little bit to, to somebody that could need, need a little bit of everybody right now. I think it's a given. They need a little extra TLC. We should assume it, you know, everybody's going through something or other. The people with six kids sitting in their, you know, two bedroom apartment in, in, in Eretz Yisrael or 12 kids or whatever it is, or, you know, uh, they there, you know, some places they're not feeling it as, as, as intensely as others. But there's definitely Jews in the world everywhere, uh, you know, suffering. There are definitely enough, enough multitudes of Jews. The, um, now, the, an, another thing he says we learned from this whole thing is that even when the Jews came out, there's an idea of thinking of, you know, hoping that Hashem is going just to, to, that they went through so much to feel what a person has gone through. Sometimes you meet people, they have a past. Everybody's got a past. They've got packages. I once met somebody who was happily married and everything, and she was getting older. And she told me, I can't stand these single women complaining all the time. You know, and I was thinking of the, the elderly people that didn't weren't married or whatever it was. And then I was thinking to myself, I didn't want to censure her, but I wanted to tell her, you know, you don't know what it means. You know, like, but, you know, like I, you, you can't judge another person unless you've been there. So we have to be able to reach out to people that are, are suffering and we have to feel their pain of maybe all the things they went through and that there's still the baggage they're still carrying with them. He says he saw a letter, Rav Nassim said he saw that um, somebody got a letter from the Stiflers, Zechran Lavracha, that he wrote that all the Kedoshim from World War II are going to get up for Tzcheos HaMesim. You know, like all they went through, it's not for naught. All the suffering we went through is not for naught. And all the suffering we're going through is not for naught. And Mir Hashem, there should be an end for our suffering too. And it should go straight to Mashiach. That's the only, that's the only way we see that this can go. But, um, you know, that's what we should daven for. Hashem is waiting for us to daven for Mashiach. And, you know, just not to alleviate. That's one of the reasons is to alleviate the suffering. And also to see Hashem has been ignored all the years. The idea of Mashiach is not that we're looking for people to be relieved of their pain. We're looking for the Rebbeinu Shalom to finally be recognized. And I always say the only being that's not, as, that's not appreciated properly besides the Rebbeinu Shalom is the Jewish mother. We always stand second place. Like someone just told me last night, she says, everybody always blames the mother for everything. And that the Jewish mother should get her place in, uh, you know, or anybody, any Jew that's been humiliated, embarrassed, should be given their proper, you know, given, in, reinstated their proper place. And we should, Hashem should erase all the, 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 the crying already from humanity. 
Okay, now let's turn that page and get on to some happy things, and that is the Megillah of Esther. Today we're going to give the, uh, some of the background that Rebrevda brings down. Rebrevda had an ancestor who was called, uh, what was called? The Yosef Lekach. And he lived in the time of the Vilna Gon, and he had a parish, and the Vilna Gon said it was a good parish. Plus the Vilna Gon gives a parish. And Megillah, the, the Vilna Gon uh, lived in the late 1600s, and he wrote in a very terse manner, very terse. They said he was reminiscent of the... Um, of the early sages, the Tanaim, the sages in the Mishnah, right? And um, it's, he says very little. And if you just read it, it sounds one way. So Rebrevda took on as his life's mission to uh, raise awareness of what the Vilna Gon was really saying, like en enhance it, elaborate on it and make it real. So we're gonna really make Megillus Rus real today. Like you've never, and Megillus Esther real, They're already drinking before Purim. And so we have to make Megillus uh, Esther, you know, open for us for Purim, and we'll um, hopefully get some amazing ideas because this really is the Gullus Megillah, and this really tells us how to look at things. Because really, in a general sense, it looked like all was terrible for the Jews. The world situation, the anti-Semitism, the, the suppression. Like, remember, we're going to start the, the whole Megillah, really, is based on, the, it begins with the story of Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar really is very applicable for today, you know? He was, uh, he was a despot. He was, you know, talk about Marxist rule and the world going to a, a place where things are suppressed and you can't even say what you wanna say. Nebuchadnezzar was a world famous ruler of Babylon, Bavel. However, um, when we say Bavel, it always means present day Iraq. And we're still see these things are still headlines today. Iraq and Iran, Paras, Paras is Iran, which is what where the story took place of Megillus Esther. And um, during his time, he was a short, fat man. They said he was shaped like a ball, but he had a few little vices. He, you know, was a megalomaniac wanting to take over the world. And um, the, 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 the Babylonian reign, he ruled over the whole world. Like God never put subjugates the Jews under small change. We're always subjugated under the biggest megalomaniacs who want to take over the whole world. Those are the people that usually, you know, we get involved with. And the 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 Malchus of Bavel was made up of the Bavlim and the Kazdim. Those are the two kinds of the Castians and the Babylonians. People were so terrified. They said during his reign, nobody ever smiled. And if people can't imagine that, Talk to somebody who lived in Stalinist Russia and uh, find out, you know, or North Korea or uh, any of these kind of places that may be taking over the whole world eventually too. Any case, he, uh, he had an uncontrollable temper and um, he was a mass murderer. In fact, any person that, I mean, whenever he'd conquer a world leader, he wanted him tortured and murdered in front of him. Nice guy. Also, he ate Aver Minachai, like he took the limb of a live animal and would just like, whatever. Uh, this is a, you know, a person like that. Now, um, eventually he was murdered by the people closest to him because these people don't usually, you know, as soon as you can, you think, you think you're a big hero and you're big, the, the strongest guy in the world. But as soon as somebody can overcome you, they want you out as soon as possible. And that's what happened to him. Now, he's very relevant besides the fact that he destroyed our temple. Uh, there's a lot that, you know, that had to do with the Jews. Their first sin took place when, when, you know, when he was in office. And he ruled over 127 countries. And, um, you know, by the way, it was very interesting. I remember during the Gulf War, at that point, I was still listening to the radio. And um, there was, um, during the Gulf War, I almost choked on my coffee one morning when I heard them saying that the elite core of Saddam Hussein is called the Nebuchadnezzar core, which shows till this day that man is glorified. He was their, you know, their biggest hit you know, of all time, you know, was Nebuchadnezzar. Now, he, he was, um, he had a son, Evel. Evel Merodach was a very common name used by a lot of these rulers. And Evel, um, he had put his own son in jail. And when it came time, when he finally died in Nebuchadnezzar, Evel was told his father died. He, he couldn't believe it. Nobody could believe it. He was terrified. He said, I want to see his grave on earth. 
and I want to see his body, and only then will I rest easy and take place as your king. And it's to go on the throne. I'm not doing it until I see he's gone because they were so terrified of a man like this. Anyways, the, um, eventually the, uh, oh, another thing, another megalomaniac thing he had that was really crazy. He, since he conquered all these countries, he decided to, um, he had like, he had acquired all these national treasures of all these countries. A national treasure would be to my mind, something like the Mona Lisa you know what I mean? Or the whatever, probably in those days, some eagle or something, gold eagle or something. For every country had some national treasures. He confiscated all of them and didn't let anyone else except him look at them. But he was so like constantly like preoccupied that somebody else is going to take them from him. He decided he had all his servants build this copper ship because copper doesn't float. He took all these 1,080 treasures and he made a canal in the middle of the Euphrates River. This is all the Midrashim that Rabbi Grevter brings down. And um, now the reason he did this was he said when he dies, he doesn't want his sons to inherit these treasures. Now it says he knows that he's gonna die. He knows he's gonna die, but yet a wicked person with the knowledge of dying still can sin like horrifically. He, he puts them in this, he opens up, he floods the canal, and this boat sinks with 1,080 treasures, so no human being besides him should ever witness these 1,080 treasures. And we're going to bring this up. This is relevant to the Megillah. That's why I'm giving you all of this information. Oh, the Vilna Gon says this, sorry, not the Medrash. Anyways, now, after 70 years of, uh, you know, dur um, well, okay, in the beginning of, of his reign, the Jews were exiled. They were actually exiled in several uh, stages. That's where all this confusion comes in. There was the first wave of people that he took out of Israel that they had to go to Babylon. And that first wave were the important people. There were prophets amongst them. There were the, 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 were the, the nobility. It was called the Harish Amasker. And then later, I think it was a difference of about 18 years, if I'm not mistaken, it's in the teens, I don't remember specifically, there was a second wave of migrants that left Israel for Babylon. And um, the, uh, now they, when he, um, so that was, you know, he, he, that's what he, his point was, he destroyed the temple and he sent the Jews in exile and there were two waves that he sent them in. Now, after, after he died, his son Evel took over for a short time, and eventually the, the Iranians, or known as the Persians in those days, the, the, they, turned, they teamed up with the Medeites, the Medeans, uh, Paras Umadai, those two kind of countries had like a league. They came together, they took over the 127 countries, and their first king was Koresh. Koresh, Cyrus the Great, he was in Book of Ezra, he was the one that gave permission for the Jews to build the base Hamikdash. Now, what people don't know, or some people forget, is that Koresh did not complete the deal. First of all, they say peoples, they say maybe the sons of Haman, somebody, uh, no, there's different, different opinions. Some people spoke against uh, the Jews and it was in the middle, it was postponed. They began the building of the base Hamikdash. And it was a pathetic amount of people that came back with Ezra, not, not too many, like 43,000 people uh, were willing, that believed that the base of Megiddo is going to be built. And maybe because they didn't believe enough, they, uh, you know, they, um, that's that, for that reason, because they didn't believe enough, maybe that's why they didn't merit to have it totally built. And um, so they had to postpone it. And then, you know, there are a few other kings, and then we find the king in Armagilla of Ahasuerosh. Um, now, during the time of Korosh, I want to say one other thing. That was also the time the Siddur was completed, that, that they had the Anshe Knesses Hakadola, 120 men, the Sanhedrin, and prophets amongst them all. They wrote the Siddur. They were the biggest based in, in history. And um, Ezra was compared to Moshe Rabbeinu by the Gemara. And it didn't happen. We didn't get to build the base of Megdish. That... Um, so we, because we didn't total tshuva, the base of English was being suspended. It wasn't finished. And Ahasuerus was a king, by the way, that did not permit it being rebuilt. So only later do we find it totally being rebuilt. One other thing I just 
forgot to mention that I'm going to mention to you right now is that during the time of Nebuchadnezzar, one of the, the first major sin that the Jews committed was Nebuchadnezzar had set up places with idols of himself all over the place. And, you know, a Jew is not allowed to bow, bow to idols no matter what, but, you know, it was like you would be murdered if you would not bow to an idol. One specific idol, he knew enough to know. He took the tzitz, that's the, uh, that's a, like a plate that was worn on the head of the coin guttle that said, Kadosh Lashem. They put this inside of a certain idol, and this idol was able to talk. And some of the Jews were so terrified, they succumbed and they bowed down to the idol for fear of death. Now, it's not a... You know, it's not a, you know, we can understand that we can judge them favorably. This is very comparable in my head to the people of Masada. You know, a lot of people say, you know, heroes, 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 because for the state of Israel, they're willing to kill themselves. Um, you're not supposed to, you're not supposed to kill yourself. It's, you know, they, they weren't heroes for killing them. So we can, under, we, can, we can judge them favorably, but that wasn't necessarily such a heroic action. The state of Israel wants them to think that they did a heroic action. But it wasn't heroic action necessarily that they killed themselves. That's not that's not something you're supposed to do. Maybe there's there were cases of 92 Beis Yaakov girls that killed themselves during World War II. They took cyanide rather than to live with Nazi soldiers who said told them to get dressed pretty for them. That is different. That's to to not to defile a Jewish woman. That's not a mitzvah to do that. You don't have to, but it's a mitzvah. This is not a case. To kill yourself, they should have let themselves be killed, but not necessarily should they have killed themselves. Here, we find in Armagilla that the Jews were afraid to be killed, so they bowed down to the idol. So it's, it's, it was, that was considered in those days, days of prophets, this was on their part a big sin that they, they were wor more worried about, you know, they didn't trust Hashem enough. They're more worried about what is Nebuchadnezzar going to do to me? What is he going to think of me? It's ta absolute terror. We can't judge them. But um, for their madrega, it was already a stain on our souls. And this stain had to be erased in the time of Ahasuerosh. Okay, so that's our background so far, which is, whew, okay, we got through that. Any, if there have any questions, just put up a question. I'll be happy to answer to you. Thank you. Now, another, uh, Ahasuerosh, the book of Esther is really, I, I, um, it's a uh, official document. We believe he was Xerxes the Eighth, or Artashashta, how you pronounce it in Aramaic. Um, the, uh, he was, it was a 12 year story. And the reason why we have to hear every word of the Megillah is because it's, it's so many details, so many coincidences, so many things. It, it really depth, it, 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 it deepens your fear of heaven, your belief, your amuna, your bitachan, if you're going to witness or hear all the details of this particular Megillah. Uh, Esther and Mordechai are buried today in Iran in a place called Hamadan. You can Google it and you'll see the grave of Mordechai and Esther. There's usually a group of some group like Lev Achim or something that goes into Iran on Tanis Esther and Davins on behalf of all the Jewish people. So it's still considered a shrine in Iran. And um, so, you know, all these people are real. And there's a book called Purim and the Persian Empire. I'm just thinking if I have it nearby. I don't have it nearby. Fantastic book where there's archaeological digs, uh, you know, where they think the palace of um, Ahasuerus was, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Many other details corroborating the history. So I felt I had to give you a little bit of a historical background in order that you should be prepared that this is why, this is a backdrop that we find the book of Esther. So if you all have your Megillas, I hope you do, because we're ready to start our long, Langa Megillah. We're going to go into the first verse of Megillas Esther, Perak Aleph, Pusik Aleph, chapter one, verse one. Okay. So, and, and we're going to see how there's no word for not where I'm, I don't know if I'm going to sit on every single word. I won't, probably won't, but there's, it'll, we're going to open up the whole thing now with the help of Rabbi Grevda, the Vilna Gon, the, the, the Yosef Lekach and others. Okay, so here's the first verse of Megillus Esther. Vayihi. Vayihi always means there's some kind of, Rashi tells us, always means there's something bad going to happen eventually. Bimei Achash Verosh. Now, and then it says, uh, in a time of Achash Verosh, this is the Achash Verosh Hamolech, which means literally rules, present tense. He rules. 
from Hodu, from India to Ethiopia, 127 countries. Now, the one question that really screams to us is, why is it in present tense? You know, let's be accurate. He ruled, you know, you're doing a historical account of something. Everybody ruled. He's He's not here anymore, you know, <laughs> unless you want to find deep meetings that he's coming back or he's here. He's really the Mashiach. I don't know. But um, the uh, th this means he he's presently ruling. Now, what does it mean he's presently ruling? So it says a phenomenal thing of the Vilna Gong. Um, we find that um, when it says he rules, the, the, we're told in Chazal, it says, he wasn't worthy of being king. He spent a lot of money. He wasn't, yes. when you say somebody ruled, that insinuates that he was a ruler. They're trying to say, mm -mm, he didn't acquire this legally. He bribed his way through to become a ruler. You may have heard um, Medrash in the past that Ahasuerus was formerly a stable boy in Babylonia. Um, in fact, um, he was, uh, during the time Belshazzar, who was this, uh, another uh, grand, uh, a son or a grandson, I don't remember, of, of, um, of what's his name, of Nebuchadnezzar, that Belshazzar was the father of Vashti. So I think Vashti is the granddaughter of Nebuchadnezzar. And during the, his rule of Belshazzar, we find that um, Ahasuerus was his stable boy. He dealt with the horses. Now, what happened? Either he won the New York City Powerball or somehow he acquired money. And he was, they said, the, the Vilna Gon said he was a brilliant man when it came to politics. Now, there's other people doing this. This sounds so reminiscent of what we're going through in our day. It's unbelievable. He, 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 what he did was he wined and dined ministers and he took them out on those, his jets. And, you know, he said all kinds of things. And by the time he was done, he made his way up the corporate or the <laughs> ministerial ladder. And he became the king of all Persia because there was no heirs to the king before him. And he bought it. He bought the throne. That's what he did and, and, by buying and smearing. Now he knew there were three things that he has to have to really, you know, okay, you buy, you, you establish your throne by, um, you know, by purchasing and by bribing and by a lot of money. You know, when you have all these corporate people like giving, pouring the money in your campaign and then you have money that you can silence other people and that you can, you know, whatever, you have a lot of things you could do with money. So he used it for that purpose. And now he decides that he has to secure everything. You know, and if you think it's so crazy, this is this is really the North American mm -hmm. mentality that with money, you could do everything right. I mean, there's people in high government positions today that have no that have no experience in anything, but just they're wealthy and uh, they, they but through their wealth, they're all of a sudden the head of this commission, the head of that commission, and they have private jets and they could go here and there and everywhere because they, you know, they're different class, you know, so it's nothing so unusual. So he, so he wants, the one thing he wants, so he wants to have like the whole thing secured by the people. So he decides he wants to be a populist leader. So what does he do? He decides he needs three things to secure his throne. Number one, he needs to marry royalty. Why did Hillary stick it out with Bill? <laughs> Anyways, you know, um, the, the uh, Lahavdil, well, I don't know Lahavdil, they're about the same ilk, but anyways, people stick it out for different reasons. It's very interesting how, you know, whatever. The uh, Tamerian to royalty, especially in those days, that was your only claim to fame. He's got to get some kind of royal wife. That way he'll have his throne secured. Number two, he needs, in modern times, photo ops. He's got to be standing by the Lincoln Memorial. I'm really putting myself in an American framework, even though I'm living here in Toronto, but I am an American. So I guess I still go back there sometimes for points of reference. Um, you know, he's got to have backdrops of him being with all these places and all these people and doing all these things. So they didn't have photo ops, but he has to be, you know, he has to have all these people around him. And the third thing is he really needs a lot of opulence, especially in ancient um, Persia, 
the Persians specifically, they were like the equivalent of the Italians, or maybe some people would say the old Hungarians. You know, everything was full of gold and opulent. And, uh, you know, this is the way they like to live. This showed, you know, that you're a hozu and a what's what. So any case, so here we find the next thing he's, so he's, he's now, he's, he's ruling over 127 countries. So what does he do? We see that in um, the, uh, so this, uh, oh, now the interesting thing is, even though he needs this wife and this backdrop and this opulence, Chazal tell us, a place does not honor a person. A person honors the place he sits in. You know, we as Jews are supposed to look like, okay, maybe it, we live in such a narish of like they say, a foolish world where people think that, you know, you have this as your backdrop, you have your palace, palatial uh, experience when you walk into a certain home. So that, that already gives like a lot of credence to who you are. We know our greatest gedolim, our greatest Torah leaders live in little shacks, so to speak. And because we, because we believe the person, because you strip the person of all those exterior props, the person really is what gives honor. You know, no matter what age they are, no matter what they look like, it's how, look at, look, what other religion, we had a Rosh Hashiva of one of the biggest yeshivas in the world with Parkinson's, you know, shaking, shaking and trembling, you know, and everyone is looked, uh, dying to hear his every word, whatever he says, we, this is what we had in the Jewish world, you know, we don't value the external trap, uh, uh, trappings, you know, the external trappings is not what we value. We value the, the person themselves because it's true. At the end of all days, no one's going to remember somebody and say, oh, did he have a palace? Oh, did he have a punim? Did he have a face? Did he have a appearance? We remember the good deeds. We remember what the kind of person he was. Remember how he, I'm being, I think I happen to have three phones around me right now by accident, as, as happens every once in a while. And here they are all ringing. Um, the, um, the, a person is, is, is what makes his place. A person has a certain dignity. A person has a certain simcha. A person has a certain, you know, selflessness. This is what attracts people like, like honey. This is what people like to see. They don't need to see like, I've got this and I've got that. And I've got this yichas and that yichas. Even in the firm world, it can happen. It's really, how do you treat me? How do you act? That's your conduct. That's really what remains with the person. Any case, so we find in the second verse, in the third year, I'm sorry, um, by when by Amimahem, Keshevis Hamelach Hashverosh, Al Kisei Malchuso, Asher Bishushan Habirat. You think this is a simple verse? You read it as children. And it was in those days when the king sat on his throne that was in Shushan. Guess what? Few details that the Vilna Gon is going to illuminate for us. The capital of Bavel, and it's throughout the prophets, the capital of Bavel for centuries was a place called Elam. All of a sudden, Shushan becomes the capital in Armagilla. How did it become the capital? There's a story. And what's the story? And why does it say, and it was in those days when he sat on his throne, because remember, here's the guy that says, I need to, here's the photo op. I'm going to be on this fancy throne. He gets into his mind. I don't want just a throne. I want the uh, uh, image, a model of the throne that King Solomon had. Now, Shlomo Melech in, in, in ancient times had a magnificent throne. I think it was of gold, but his, he tried to make it of silver, if I'm not mistaken. Now, his, his throne, mechanically genius. It would be that every step up, that you took the, by the way, the throne of Ahasuerus was as large as a home, as a house. Okay. And he, every step up, another animal would come like to, two animals would come to meet him. Like, I think there was eagles and bears and lions, each step of way up. There was like a, it was a mechanical, uh, you know, incredible thing in those days. And um, eventually, as he reached the top step, an eagle, I think it was an eagle at the end, an eagle would come and put the throne on, uh, put the crown on his head. Uh, it's such a, you know, a whole uh, thing like that. For us to have fear of reverence for uh, monarchy. Now people think, come on. But if you think about it, first of all, the Kotel, how could it be in the time of King Solomon, those huge stones were transported? 
How could they? It's like it defines the mind. There's a place in Eretz Yisrael called Megiddo, and I went on a tour with um, Rav Pesach Levi Shvigazunt, and uh, years ago, and it was amazing. Megiddo, which is in Nazareth, Nazareth, it was a port city, and King Solomon had like a summer palace there, and he showed us a certain place because it was on a mountain and it's it's in a very strategic area. So they had to, cons they wanted to have a place where they could have water saved up for emergencies. They had a lot of other miracles there too, a lot of brilliance in that palace. But just to show how brilliant King Solomon was, the um, they had people chiseling through a mountain to, uh, there was a spring they found and they had to chisel through the mountain. They had people chiseling on both sides of the mountain and they would meet in the middle. And you could see, he showed us how the chiselers, some, you know, they all, you could see by the direction, you know, I guess you have to do it upward. I don't know. I don't remember that, but it's upward, I think, or downward. I don't remember, but in the rock, they were chiseling. And you see the other people, you could see the marks and in the middle, it met exactly. That is a miracle. That shows that there was brilliance in the way they did this. We're talking about a huge tunnel, a huge uh, mountain rather, that they had to chisel through and people coming from opposite ends had to meet exactly. They said the English Channel that was made in the early 19, early 20th century, they did not. They missed by six inches the, to, to meet the two places to meet to produce the English Channel. They they didn't meet. Here, King Solomon's people met exactly in the middle. Amazing, and there are many other things he did. Brilliant, brilliant I, thoughts of King Solomon. So this 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 is like a, a miracle how he made that um, how he made that throne in those days. With the knowledge, you know, we, it, it, I'm doing an aside here, but I think it's worth it. The aside is that we say in our tefillah, das bina. we say in Shemona Esrei, you have uh, endowed the world with das and you taught humankind bina. Bina usually means to understand something, infer something from something else. So Rav Shimon Schwab, Sechran Lavracha says a beautiful explanation. He says, what does it mean you teach humanity, Bina? He says, we may think we're so brilliant today. Let's say we have cell phones and we have all kinds of technology, but is on the shoulders of other people. It wouldn't be, let's say, for Alexander Graham Bell. He, he, everybody's doing another building block. All we're doing is standing and understanding things that were already developed by somebody else. Like it's a whole building block that humanity has to gain from each other. So too, you know, we can, it's, we can only marvel how they did accomplish this huge accomplishment. Anyways, he wanted his throne. So in those days, to get an artesian, to make a, a throne like this for a king, nobody, there were no takers because people were absolutely terrified. If you don't do what the king asked exactly, off with your head. You weren't, you weren't going to be able to live to see the next day. So people didn't want to make this throne for, for uh, Ahasuerus. They thought they maybe wouldn't be able to accomplish it. However, Shushan was a little backwater town in Persia. Probably you'd call it like Lakewood. Today, modern Shushan is called Sus. Um, again, it's in, it's in Iran. And um, in that place, they... Uh, they, they were like some, you know, greenhorns, whatever you want to call small town folk. They didn't realize what, how difficult it is not to listen to the king. So they decided they're going to take it on. Now, the problem was it took them three years to make the throne. And when they finally finished it, they couldn't move it. I told you it was the size of a house. How are you going to move this thing? So what does the king do with his great brilliance? He moves the capital in order to accommodate his throne, instead of saying, just sit there in the summer, go there for the summer months, sit on your fancy throne in the summer. But no, no, they had to move the embassies. They had to move the hotels. They had to move the restaurants. They had to move everything to Shushan Habira, only became Shushan Habira right now because to accommodate the king's throne. That's why it says in this verse, that's why that's what the whole greatness is of this verse. In those days, when he sat on his throne in Shushan Habira, in the third verse, third, third year of his reign, he reigned all together. It was a 12-year story. Now, uh, it mentions that because uh, it, that was a big accomplishment. Finally, after three years, the throne is ready. Then he makes a party for all of his ministers and, and servants and all the like um, military of Paras and Madai, the Partumim are the important people and the, all the other uh, ones. Now, in verse four, there are four adjectives given 
to what he displays at this party. Osher, Kavod, Malchuso, Yikar, Tiferes, Gedulaso. Six objects that, um, six objects of adjectives of the way he's going to show all of the, his wealth. See this thing, <laughs> don't think we're removed from this. What is the president? I'll give you all an Obama phone. I'm going to give everybody free college education. You are all going to get just what I get. You guys can go. You, you, you person, you changed your, your, your now your 56 type of genders on this earth. All of you people are honorable, respectable. I'm going to show you everything and give you everything. You're going to have history months and mem memorials of all the wonderful things that you people have accomplished because you are the, the, the common folk. I don't know about common, God forbid, but anyways, you people are the ones that are going to, um, the, you know, you people were gonna have for 180 days a party to honor all of you folk. Now, what are, why are there six adjectives? So guess what the Vilna Gon says, or we, I think it brings down the Medrash. Let me just find it for a second. Um, okay, one second. 180 days he had his party. He, it said every day Ahasuerus showed what happened was, I forgot to mention, here we go, bring it up now right here. Koresh, you know, when somebody has a good thought, even though he didn't carry out his good thought, his good deed, Koresh had some scuba divers who merited to unearth the ship that Nebuchadnezzar sunk and he came across the 1,080 treasures. Now, so he had them, and what does Akashverus do to win over the people besides the throne and the queen and the whole business? He decides to have every day people witnessing for 180 days, six treasures. Do the math, six times 180 is 1,080. He showed these treasures that nobody had ever witnessed in their life to these people of his 127 countries, for those, for the, the, you know, for the continuum of this, uh, of this uh, whole thing of the party. Now, so he felt he's gonna have a banquet. Now, why did he have to have Shushan Habira? We all know why, because Esther and Mordechai were there. At the time, it looks just like a story. You know, <laughs> there's, there's a lot we don't know even today what's going on, why this and why that and why in this place and in that place. And we find that what ends up happening is it's all for the Jews. Everything that happens in the world is for the Jews and this too also. Now, every person, it says that he, um, now the, when he, um, okay, so he showed them all these wonderful things. Now the, um, when he finished this party, uh, the, uh, verse five, Pasuk Hey, Uvimlo Ose Amima Ela after 180 days for the, the who's who. Then he makes another party for people in Shushan. Anybody, Gadolad Katan, seven days. You know, um, now he does this, says the Vilna Gong, because he wants to secure the people you need to be the most chummy with are the people in your own hometown because they're going to, you know, they're the last sort of the last line of defense in case of any type of attack. You have to make sure that they're all loyalists to you, the place closest to where you live. So he has an additional seven days for them. Now, these people in Shushan, uh, it's in the Chatzar Ginas Bisan Hamelach. That means in the courtyard where there were gardens. Well, it's, it's spilled out. At first, in the, they were in the courtyard uh, where the party was held, but it spilled out. Good morning from a... They, uh, it, it spilled out into, from the courtyard, it spilled out into the garden that surrounded the courtyard. Now, if you look in Pasuk Vav, it talks about all these magnificent, uh, like all kinds of magnificent things that, um, on uh, you know, the pillars, and it goes into the types of beds they had, and the flooring. He put jewels in the floor that the most lowly people could trample on, you know, because he, this, every schnook could, this is democracy. The, uh, what does Rebrevda say? He think he says that, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, democracy is not always, you know, so simple. It's, it's sometimes you, you, you fail to ignore, you fail to give respect to the, the important people when you're giving to everybody, then some people get lost out and this is the important people, you know, get lost out. 
But any case, so they, uh, he has people trampling on these things. And in, in verse eight, we're told, kedas enones. Now, there is two kinds of drink that they had going on in those days. Just trying to find one thing. Lena, just excuse, give me one second. Okay. Now, after this party, 180 days, then the seven day party in Shushan, he's feeling really full of himself. He says, you know what? I can do anything at this point. The people love me. I'm pampering them. I'm giving them everything. I'll continue doing so. And then I've secured my kingdom. So now he says, Hashasia Kadas. In those days, there was sort of an unspoken rule. This is more of a guy thing, but we can all get, you know, that if you were a man, you could drink up your, your, uh, you know, you could drink up a certain, they'd give you a big thing to sit in front of a king. You'd have to down a certain cup of wine, a big cup. And it showed that you were a man, if you could still withstand that, you know, after you drank that cup of wine. By the way, there was something like that in Gare. I think it was the Furia de Gareva in Gare that he used to have his Hasidim, he'd give them tea and they'd have to like drink it down. Uh, to show that they, you know, in front of the Rebbe, they would, um, they would, uh, you know, they would, they would do what he wants and he would do it quickly. And he is, but tea is a little bit different than wine. <laughs> Any case, so Shia Kadas, so that was the unspoken rule, but Anonase, there's no pressure. You, if you want, you have these huge goblets, you could drink 50 ounces of wine, or if you don't want the wine, Anonase, there's not, we're not, no, we're no, you know, nobody's being forced in, or coerced into doing it. Um, you know, is in, in this kingdom. Um, where are we? Kikain Yisad HaMelech, because this is what the king established. I'll call Rav Beiso every man, Lasos Kirtzon, Ish Ish, to do according to every man's wish. So some people said it was Ish Ish, meaning this is a very famous old thing you learn as a kid that uh, that uh, Achishver said, even, you know, they had hexers there, they had anything there that you'd want, you know, the, uh, they had, um, you know, for the Frum people, for Haman, for Mordechai, everything anybody could want. But listen to this, what the Vilna Gon says, anybody who's ever done any kind of catering, this is absolutely insane to please people. You can ruin your life to please people. This is really Mr. People Pleaser. And we should learn a lesson from this, especially when it comes to making Shalach Manas, or when it comes to making uh, people, the men, you know, like whatever, whatever people want to do, show their prowess, whether it be drinking, whether it be, uh, you know, anything we do on Purim, decorating, doing things, to do Ratzon Ish for Ish, to make everybody happy. <laughs> you can't make everybody happy, right? You can only make some people happy. Anytime they make a state dinner, usually there is one thing on the menu. When you have thousands of people coming, if you want to make a good dinner, you can only make one one type of entree, you know, one main course. Um, okay, sometimes somebody's gluten free or this free or that free. They have two choices, three maybe. But lasos kirtzon ish for ish means that they were commissioned. The cooks there, a guy says, "I want, you know, I want my omelet easy over. I want no. I want, you know, I want uh, the, the. I don't want the eggs showing at all. I want flakes. I want milk eggs. I want ribs. I want. I want duck. I want this. I want that. I want, but not too much basil. I want a little on the oregano. I want dill. I want." Can you imagine for thousands, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people, asos kitzon, ish for ish, what that means? It, insane to please people. How crazy can you go and, 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 you know, turning yourself upside down for such a thing? You know, that's a Democrat, you know, like he's trying to uh, <laughs> please everybody. Now, you can't satisfy everybody. It says, Latava yifakesh nifrad. If you want to fulfill all your desires, it makes, you're going to be angry at somebody. You can't fill all your desires if other people are on the face of this earth with you. It's, it's impossible. Now he's getting more and more feeling comfortable. I feel like he doesn't need Vashti. Everybody's eating out of his hand. He doesn't need her. So what does Vashti do? In the next verse, we find that, um, we find in the next verse in Pusik Tess, Vashti also made a party. Now that's very interesting. Why did Vashti made a party? It's first of all, think about this. In those days, there wouldn't be females at a party. That was how modest it was. We could even get an idea just even the beginning of the 
20th century, people were already dressed modestly. You know, uh, you know less than 100 years ago, but you know, that uh, people were still dressed modestly. And then <laughs> everything went awry. But Vashti made her own party. Why? Because she's trying to show them, wait a second, I'm, the, I'm your claim to fame. Where does she make it? Look in verse 9. Beis Hamalchus. She makes it in the royal room. Can you imagine? She makes it in the royal room of the king to show <laughs> you think you're the king and they're eating out of your hands. I'm your claim to fame. That's she's trying to tell him. Now it's where it is, is Beis Hamalchus. Like Beis Hamalchus would be a room where the king would contemplate. He'd sit there and think about, you know, all these kingly things, be all by himself. She had the audacity to take that room. That's going to be the women's room. Now, where was this room? We're told it was adjacent to the courtyard, meaning the men who were getting really in a drunken stupor, they could hear all the women next door, and that spells disaster in the room next door. And, you know, women aren't always too quiet when they all get together. Now, by the way, even though it says that women have nine tenths of speech in the world and men only have one, you know, men can do their share of speaking. I just think that what it means, what well, it's not, I think, I've heard an explanation. Women, what it means, they have 10 measures of, nine measures of speech were given to the women. Measures of speech are different types of speech, consolation, making people happy, uh, you know, um, empathy. Women have more types of speech in their arsenal than men do. Men usually are like, you know, <laughs> straight and uh, straight and arrow, you know, and the women, very rarely do you have a man that can speak in a multifaceted type of way. Anyways, um, we find, I'm just going to go a few more minutes because I feel it's almost an hour and I don't want to take your time, but uh, I, I really shouldn't have planned another thing. I really should have just done this. But in any case, when the, the king was, when he was in his cups, he calls these seven uh, ministers to come and he tells them, Pasuk Yudalaf, verse 11, to bring Vashti Hamalka. Now, why does it say Vashti Hamalka? We're going to see in this chapter, inter, inter uh, sparingly, we interspersed rather, we find sometimes she's called Vashti Hamalka and sometimes she's called Hamalka Vashti, either Queen Vashti or Vashti the Queen. And there is significance why it's, you know, there's such a differentiation. And the reason is that Vashti here, but when the men, it says in the Medrash, the men were all starting to argue. He hears a whole loud noise and Ahasuerus is upset. What? Somebody's not happy at my party. I want to please Ish for Ish. I want to please everybody. What's going on? Like, how can I, how can I make everybody happy? What's going on? So they tell him, your highness, they're arguing over who are the most beautiful women. They started arguing over different women. This woman, California girls, like what kind of girls are the most beautiful? You know, like they're trying to decide which, which girls are the most beautiful. And um, Ahasuerus says, obviously Babylonians. And I've got something myself. Now he was going to bring in Vashti Hamalka, mostly Vashti because she was very good looking. And Malka, secondly, I'm going to present, she shows more beautiful than all her. Now here he's really sure of himself. Because before he was kowtowing to Vashti, she's my claim to the throne. She's my royal connection. But here he feels he can do it. He wants to please Ish for Ish, please everybody. So what he says is that he's going to have Vashti come. And, you know, now when it says Lahavias Vashti Hamalka, it, um, now the, the thing is Vashti herself was not a, you know, morally upstanding woman. But God afflicted her that day, either they say with some kind of boils or with a, some kind of growth that was not nice looking, and she didn't want to appear. So they see, sends these people, and she says two things to him. She gives him two messages. Number one, my father, tell the king, my father was a real king, and he, he toasted thousands of guests and he didn't get drunk, and you're a stable boy, and you can't hold your wine. And secondly, I'm not coming. I'm, I refuse to come. So they had to go transmit this message back to the king. That says, Pasuk Yudbeis, Batima Ain, she refused. Hamalka Vashti. She's first the queen. I'm the royal woman. First Vashti, second. 
And I, on the, you know, being a queen, I refuse to come before you in such a manner because when he asked her that she has to bring Vashti Hamalka with a crown, it meant to say that the Rashi says only with a crown. She was one of, he wanted her to come only with a crown so nobody will have any arguments over who's the most beautiful woman, but um, she refused. Now, so now the, the king summons in Pasigid Gimel, he summons people that are politically correct they know what's going on and what'll be popular or populist to say. You could even say the media. He gets the media under his belt. He tells them I'm gonna instruct the media and have, and direct them as to what I should be doing. They are going to just do my, you know, after all, there's a lot of money involved here. So, you know, a lot of sponsorships. So we will get the media to just repeat my, my words. Um, because this is what he wanted. He wanted people that are Yodei Das Vadin. They know the law or they know how to manipulate the law and they also know what's going on. So he has these um, ministers, seven ministers. A new minister appears in this verse in Pasuk Yadal, and that's Mamuchan. Mamuchan is Haman. Here's how he first comes in. Mamuchan literally means he's prepared. He's prepared now. He's setting up, he, he's going to grow high as the sky, but he's going to fall as far as they can fall eventually. And um, he's going to ask what to do by Malka Vashti, Pusik Tesvav, what do I do about the royal predicament that I'm in that, you know, here she refused me and look how bad, you know, it's, it's going to be that she didn't want to come to me. Um, now, one of the things that happened when the king hears the words that they refuse to listen, to do his bidding. It says, The king got very angry and the anger burned within him. Why are we mentioning it twice? So says the Vilna Gon that usually the idea is like this. A person needs to vent sometimes to feel better. Now, psychologists, I don't know, maybe they've changed their tune, but I remember years ago, psychologists used to say, get a punching bag and you know, get out your anger and then you, then you won't have anger. The Torah believes if you get out your anger too much uh, in other ways, it teaches you that, uh, that you shouldn't control yourself. We believe the more you control yourself, the more you're used to being controlled. So anyways, there was two parts of it. He was angry, but there's an anger in him. The two, ang the two angers were the anger that he exhibited was what she refuses to come but there was an anger he had to hold within and that anger was she said you're a stable boy and you don't even know how to hold your drink that he couldn't reveal to people as to the reason why he was angry because that would be showing who he really was so he kept that in and Ahasuerus did not learn Masila Sisharim he didn't learn Musser books to try to correct his attributes as all these heads of state, they don't, they're all into their own dignity and their own everything. And we're here into improving our character. That's what we as Jews are supposed to, our mandate. And they're not here to improve their character. So it's burning, he can't get rid of that anger. So when he hits these people and he asks them, what do we do about her? Because she didn't do, if you notice in Pusik Tezvav, she didn't do mom or Hamela. She didn't listen to what the king's uh, command to come. So Mamuchan gets up. Now, this is unusual, unprecedented. Here, a minister refuses. Uh, he, he, usually, you're a seat, you're a junior member of Congress, and you're going to speak up. Usually, it's not, you're just, you're junior. Listen to people on your first day at work. Listen to what other people say. But no, Chata Chutzpah, is the first day he says, I've got a proposal. He says, not only the king did Vashti not listen to, but all the ministers. Because that means like there's going to be an upheaval. If, if you know, it, it's like it's it's a national disaster if she doesn't listen. The problem here, I'm just going to leave off with this, and we're going to finish this next time, is that we're going to leave you off with the dilemma, leave you a little bit of a hanger, cliffhanger, not really, but a minor one, and that is that you know, um, in the olden days, a king could only put to death somebody if it was a nat national danger. He was not allowed for personal reasons to put anyone to death because then he's not being represented as king, at least in Persia, that was the ancient uh, rule. So Haman is trying to tell him, no, this is a national problem that we're being presented with. It's not just um, you know, a wife not listening to her husband here. This, is, this represents a whole like coup against the king. 
So that's what he's, that's his idea. That's where we're going to leave off on Pusik, um Tez, uh, Tez Zion. That's what we're leaving off. We're going to continue next week. We'll probably finish G uh, Base Gimel and, and the end of Aleph. Um, so I just want to wish you all what we learned from this. You see all the in underpinnings. We don't know. It says, Atzas Hashem Hisakum. What Hashem wants ultimately prevails. It looks like they've got the upper hand they're doing all these these political maneuverings and gesturings and people are suffering from it from all the things that are doing to them but ultimately just like in the story of esther uh the good will prevail and hashem will take over and some and esther was a hidden story and much as it's very appropriate for our day and age it's always appropriate as long as we're in gullus and poor will not last after gullus ends hopefully this will be our last poor in gullus I mean, we shouldn't even make it to Purim. We should have Mashiach tonight, today. Uh, if we listen, Mance Hashem, we'll have Mashiach okay. right now. So I uh, thank you all for listening. I thank our wonderful administrator, Rivka, who does such a phenomenal job. And I uh, I missed you all. Hopefully we can all see each other in person, Mance Hashem, soon by the Vinyan Base of Migdash Lashlishi Bekarov Mamish. I have a question. Question? Okay.